in all this chatter about nepotism people forget that the 25 directors that i have introduced as first time filmmakers 80 to 90% of them are not from the industry they have no um i believe very strongly in, in the lgbtq btq qia plus community during the pandemic when we had certain news channels who were saying heavily inappropriate things yes. about us yeah all of us got we read everything i yeah. watch everything i want validation from everyone including critics Twenty-five years of Dharma Productions under you. You inherited the production house when it was now what we call a medium-sized business, uh, but you've turned it into what I can confidently call an empire. Did you know how things were going to turn out twenty-five years ago? Oh my God, no! <laughs> I didn't. I didn't realize that I would be on that set uh, of Kuch Kuch Hota Hai when I was in college. Uh, my parents were vehemently against me being a part of the business my father had a tiny export business which was called yashwan exports we were middle agents to a store called pierre import um in america and france uh we used to sell wrought iron to them and simultaneously my father produced these big tent pole films but besides his very first film which is how dharma productions was yeah. formed in 1980 he had several setbacks yeah um one after the other the films didn't work so my mother was convinced that this was not the profession for anyone she kept saying you should get a stable job with a stable salary that was her obsess obsession to the extent that when i joined an arts college because i went to zen zaviers yeah i came back to a weeping mother and she said you've got to move from arts to commerce because your father's business acumen is not its best yeah. i'm a work i'm a housewife i'm not working yeah. and if you also land up doing something in the arts i'm to, i'm going back now like 35 years yeah uh like she says like what will happen i'm your only child and i want you to be secure financially and so i listened to her like all good uh sindhi punjabi boys are and i changed from my fifth day at zain saviors to hr college but i had a lot of my school friends who were already at hr so it felt fine but in those were the days that you know we were very impressionable by things our parents said then the second stage came as post my bcom and i was a very academic student i topped the state of maharashtra are you serious yeah in my, you know i bcom i got a seat at the bajaj institute of management to do my further studies post the bcom and i told the principal at that time mrs indushani and i declined it and she said you're declining a seat at yeah. this institute of yeah. management and i said uh, yes because i want to make movies so she said but then why did you study so hard yeah. and that was the perception right at that point of time and i was like it is my passion it is my uh, my goal but i'm not sure my parents would be happy uh, i took some while to convince them that i wanted to join aditya chopra as his ad on dilwale dulhaniya le jayenge my parents were happy they were like so what was the draw for you what i grew up called? watching hindi cinema number no. 1 that is all i knew from the age i grew up in south bombay which you very well know is a neighborhood uh, that you know is not connected to the at least then not now not yet <laughs> yeah but even now i think they are much more connected or some pretend not to be yeah. but in those days it was genuinely they were disconnected they weren't yeah. aware my drive was like ever since i was 8 years old i was obsessed with hindi film music I used to listen to it on the radio. My mother used to listen to old Hindi film songs, and I used to sit and like visualize what they would look like. And then when the VHS phase, the video cassette phase came in, I would get into the zone and watch those movies time and again. Yeah. And I became like somebody living in the lap of South Bombay, mm -hmm. who didn't have uh, anybody. who was like my partner in in cinema crime uh to kind of watch these watch movies, movies with, with. i yeah. used to go on my own to the cinema yeah. hall i used to take anyone in the house you know whether yeah. it was a member of our, yeah. our help or you know uh, yeah. nobody my mom and dad didn't come with me i had a, one or two friends that were interested yeah. more or less not and i built this love in my heart yeah. thinking that this is just a passion yeah. for me a, a sense of entertainment but never a professional goal yeah uh wasn't something that i envisaged would ever happen um but you don't write your own destiny you know someone else does i think the universe does so how was the ride how was the last 25 years it's been great i mean 
I, for my first film, I mean, um, the first three years were great. I made Kuch Kuch Hota Hai, went to Kabhi Kushi Kabhi Gam, wrote Kal Hona Ho. Um, the big setback happened when I was 31 years old and I, my father passed away uh, of cancer. Uh, and that happened on the sets of Kal Hona Ho. Um, and for me, at that point of time, it was very difficult because uh, I had never got involved in the business aspect of things. I used to yet, like, have my father give me, like, money. Even though I was a 31 year old grown man, but I used to, I was a grown up man, but I used to go to him and he would never deny me anything. But I used to still go to him yeah. for pocket money yeah. uh, or like any expenses I needed, like he would like be the one yeah. to take money from. Uh, I had never met my chartered accountants. I'd never looked at a single like bank transaction. When I came back from my first award show where you signed autographs at that yeah. time. When he, my father sent me a couple of checks, I wrote lots of love, Karan Johar, and he yeah. came back and he said, that's not how you sign a check. Yeah. They don't want your love, they want your money. And I'm like, okay, so I get it. So, you know, it was obviously, I was not not at all in the zone uh, to drive Dharma Productions. Um, I had no family. Uh, my mom is the only child. I was not really connected to my father's side of the family. I had some great friends and they continue to be there. But that time, I just contacted my best friend from school, Apurva. Um, he was in London working in the financial division in the UK office of YRF. My God. Um, and overnight, he and his wife packed, packed their bags. They had just bought a new house in London and just came in and he became the CEO of Dharma. And I was like, let's just do this together. Like, I can't shut my company down because I don't know finances or business. But this is my father's dream and I can't, you know, just, I can't abandon it and move on to just being a filmmaker an individual filmmaker and um, he's like I don't know anything about the business I was like well join the gang I only know how to make movies you're anymore. being humble you no, produced 50 films in 25 years that all happened after this but that point of time I hadn't done any of the, the heavy lifting yeah we kind of learned Apurva and I kind of learned on the job together we were, became like like he became not only family to me he always was but he became like a sibling that was like guiding me in whenever I needed to. And we learned, we made some mistakes, we fell flat, we rose, we grew. We grew. Um, but Kuch Kuch Hota Hai, your first film was a, a mega hit. It was yes. it brought South Bombay to the movie theatres, <laughs> for sure. It workloads that South Bombay were. But, um, I mean, 25 years and 50 films is like a film factory, you know. Yeah. Well, things just happened. We, we, I was very encouraging to first-time filmmakers. And I think that's been the biggest strength at our company. Uh, in all this chatter about nepotism, people forget that the 25 directors that I have introduced as first-time filmmakers, 80 to 90% of them are not from the industry. They have no connection. They're from the outside. But you get very little credit for cinematographers, stylists, designers, production, uh, people in the production that you launch, you introduce, you give them first opportunities. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a crew of 2,000 people, there are a percent of it are from people in the industry. The rest of it are all non, are non film people, outsiders. And uh, I think what I did is I encouraged a lot of first-time filmmakers to make their first pieces of, of work for me. Yeah. And it takes a lot because I believe that the only one strength I think I had was uh, delegation and then trust. Because you can't delegate without trusting. So delegation is to be followed by trust. And that was an inherent quality I had. I could delegate, you know, and then have faith, mm. you know, not like control like a freak. Because then you can't do anything. You can't tell different stories, can't deal with different people, you know, can't handle different temperaments. You have to kind of like, and people skills. I think I got that from my dad. He always said people need people. Yeah. And for that, if they need people, then you've got to be there for them as well. So, um, but I think that's a great business lesson because at the end yeah. of the day, it is all about people, right? Whether it's, it's um, demand or supply, it's, it's all about people. percent handling fragile egos, uh, insecure minds, complex energies, uh, and some delusion. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes a lot to handle that. That's 80 to 90 percent of my job profile. 10 percent is the talent. Everything else is people managing. You know. How did you manage yourself? Who was Karan Johar 25 years ago? Innocent, lost. Lost. But very confident of his writing. Yeah. You know, but lost because it was the big world of Bollywood. And I was just a tiny spectacle trying to make my mark. But I found my feet after my first film. 
Yeah. I always knew that the written word was stronger than anything else. Yeah. Uh, but I was so much more innocent, so much more convinced about things, so much not, so much less affected by the fact that there was no social media then. There was no, not as many critics, as many social commentators. It was just a time that it was audience. Your film was judged by only an audience. They had no other, you know, judgment of it. Uh, through this 25 year journey, so much has changed, you know. Uh, literally, film moved to digital. Yeah. Uh, you know, silence moved to PR. Yeah. Uh, uh, like you know, a, stra- a simple strategic vanilla release became a huge marketing campaign. Yeah. Publicists, agencies. Yeah. None of this was there. Yeah. Like you know, I've seen the evolution in front of my eyes. Yeah. I literally saw from like the fact that there was no no such thing as a press conference to like dealing with the media. There was no such thing as like media uh, junkets and none of this. And then there was no Amazon, there was no Netflix, yeah. there was no Hotstar, there was no Z5, there was no yeah. digital world. It was a free, happy zone. Um, but the one thing is that has happened is a lot of advancement, a lot of discipline, a lot of professionalism, but at the cost of the simplicity, the honesty, and the conviction that most of us had. Now, a lot of it has to be. Um, recreated or rather reinvented. Like I have to reinvent my conviction. I have to reinvent even my basic innocence as a filmmaker. And I think that's the big, biggest strength you have because 25 years later, you've learned the ropes and you're still on top of the game. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, I'm, I mean, I'm sure you have changed emotionally as well. You're not as lost as you were. Yeah. But, you know, to learn these new, you know, for example, it's not, it's not just enough to be an amazing storyteller, which mm-hmm. was always your strength. But, you know, it's really now like the fish even has to learn to climb the tree, yeah. you know. And, and, and you've had your fingers in all those pies and you've sort of excelled in all of that. So I want to know what that drive was in you for you to still be controlling your narrative, still being on top of everything that film or the film industry is now. Look, I'm going to say two things. Um, I give a lot of emphasis on relevance. Like, I what does that mean? Re- so I, I can just hear this term being bandied about, and like it gives me goosebumps. I don't know what it means. To be relevant is most essential. Now, how are you relevant? How you are relevant when you can cater to every single generation, and even understand the needs of a generation that would today be your children you know, and understand their mindset. How do you cater to an audience that is from Gen Z to the 80s and 90s? And the Gen Z kids think in a certain way, hear a certain kind of music, listen to certain kinds of uh, podcasts, watch a certain kind of film, have a totally different approach to relationships, love, family dynamics than what you and I may have had. Um, My desire to remain relevant made me for, made me take decisions to surround myself with people of that generation that I could actually like a sponge absorb from. So listen to the young. Listen to the young, listen to the restless, listen to the the things that they have to say because they're way brighter than they are. Pro- See, the Gen Z is promoted as this Tinder left-right swiping generation who are trigger happy. No attention span. Actually, no tension is matter. Actually, their level of intensity is higher than yours and mine put together. When they are in a relationship, they are so angsty. That's why all the songs of, of, of maximum Spotify hits are all intense love songs. I mean, like, literally, when they have breakups, it's like a catastrophe in their life. They can't do anything else. Um, they, everything is very passionate. Everything is very highly strung. Now, you would imagine that, oh, they're a flippant generation. They're frivolous. They're not. We are far more frivolous as people than they are. They're very, 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 very angsty. And they're very full of, like, like a lot of anger. Anger for sure. Uh, and a lot of and the, the anger for society, anger for, political, for the political climate, anger for, like, artistic achievement, anger for, like, social media banter, anger for trolls. They are trolls themselves. I mean, like, it's like... So you have to understand the landscape. So to maintain relevance is everything. Um, The other thing that I realized at a very early stage that because of the kind of personality I am and what I put out, um, 
there will be emotions that will come that will be uh, that will either be love or that will be extreme hate and i'm okay with both i have to want to be totally honest with you what i'm not okay with is in, is indifference yeah so i think you can hate on me for whatever i'm doing because maybe you have a perception of me that i can't change you don't know the human being i am but at far you see oh he seems like a gossipy chap who sits and giggles on a talk show and he wears these clothes and he's just like an entitled privilege full of himself human being i believe i'm none of that mm -hmm. i believe that the person i am only people close to me will know but what i'm not okay with is that you can hate me for it i'm okay as long as you're talking about it love me if you really find my work great and you feel that i am creating something in pop culture that's relevant just for heaven's sake don't ignore <laughs> don't be indifferent to me because i don't like not being a topic of conversation i find it so interesting you say that because you've had one padma shri you had national award. two national awards yes yes okay and you're still seeking validation yes of who doesn't who creative person doesn't you, you you when you forget validation for a film when you give a shot when you direct a shot at the end of the shot you want to know what everyone's thought it's not just a movie or um an achievement a large achievement itself i feel all creative people seek validation all the time some voice it some don't i'm insecure about every move i make why did you launch therma 2.0 and thermatic and now there's dca so which... they, these were all very uh, they were verticals that so the ad division which is run by puneet malhotra manish's yeah. nephew he came to us and said look we have a brand um, ads will be interested you yeah. know why don't we create the division i said you run it It's your baby. Uh, DC uh, Dharmatic was a was an immediate extension because we are content creators, anyways. So this is a different format. We are very excited. It was helmed by Somain Mishra, who is our head of project development, yeah. both film and digital. Create mine solid resources in terms of writers and directors. He brought in so much an influx of new talent into yeah. our company. Uh, we're working with some people that people never imagined we would work with. Uh, Vasan Bala is making a film for I us. I love it. um neeraj ghevan is making a film for us uh like we had sandeep modi who directed arya night manager so we have so many of these voices that somain mishra has brought in writers yeah young writers young like so many i can't even get into how many names yeah. again selecting him was a uh, was was a um, uh, an exciting decision for both of us because i knew he had and he would he hasn't really loved any of my previous pieces of work as a director he told me he fell off to sleep watching kabhi kuch kabhi gham and i enjoyed that I enjoyed that he was honest enough to tell me that he said it was three hours and forty minutes, and I fell asleep. There were too many things happening, and there were the songs are nice, but that's about it. I, I'm okay. You see, I'm okay if you don't like my film. That doesn't matter. I'm not here for everyone to love everything I do, but what I love is the honesty. You know, I appreciate uh, unless I feel it's coming from a strong bias or any other reason. Uh, he and Rajiv Masan now helms DCA. along with Uday and Bunty but Raji was an interesting choice because he was a critic yeah. uh, and he's come in as a management head down management head again i needed somebody who understood cinema content yeah. um so it was an unusual choice but i took the leap he's and, brilliant and he's worked out so fantastically yeah. for us so these were all verticals from the core mothership of dharma productions yeah. and my reason to grow but what did this expansion mean for the business like was it a risk was were you ready to start one by one was it the way forward or was it it was it was just to expand the business yeah. um every expansion uh comes with a risk every yeah. every uh, decision to expand comes with its own dilemmas its own obstacles its own teething issues uh but if you can get it right then it's great for your company's brand value Would you know how many employees work for you altogether? Uh there are those that are on contract and okay. there are those that are permanent employees. I think permanent employees we have about over 100 um and then on contract we have over 200. So about 300 yeah. in and it keeps shifting right which each movie the it became at one point you could have 500 people yes yeah. if you have four or five things happening at the same yeah. time. The the Fair bar right. keeps shifting. and what is their profile like in terms of education and their job profile are they all creative do they come no, from management all, background legal division that yeah. their, their job profile is that they yeah. studied law yeah. uh, i have, have an interesting question about that we'll come to it i have financial teams that are all proficient in what they do yeah. we have um, 
a marketing team, a PR team. We have creative, like I said, so many, everyone educated, everyone. So 50-50, corporate and creative? Yes. 50-50, yes. management and creative. You know, I feel, and I've always been interested in doing an interview with you because I feel you have organized Bollywood as, you know, it, it's, it was otherwise a semi-organized sort of an industry. But, you know, you've sort of, you especially, and, and I, know, I know two, three others as well, have sort of built what is a modern production house and, you know, possibly the biggest one. Was this a studied, calculated idea? Because like you said earlier, the mode of filmmaking was just to create a film, release it in the cinemas. But this, you know, there were no scripts. They were written like minutes before the actor sort of mouthed them. Yeah. How did you pull it all together? I think with a lot of help from Apoorva, I would give a lot of credit to him for actually streamlining the company. Um, I am the creative fulcrum. He is the financial administration, legal fulcrum of the company. We work very efficiently with each other. I have strong opinions on what he does. He has strong opinions on what I do. But it's never, um, it's never a, a debate or a, an unhealthy discussion. It's always very much for the company. But my point is, you know, as Dharma has progressed, Bollywood has progressed in tandem with it. Yeah. You know, like you've organized your business and the film industry has organized itself to be like an industry. Well, I think one one sets the ball rolling and everyone's to follow. It's like, I remember um, Excel Entertainment started this strong AD culture. Right. How do you kind of like, in Dil Chata Hai and Lagan, um, you know, Amir took it from uh, Dil Chata Hai, the way Zoya ran a set. You know, the way, you know, Apurva Lakhya and Lagan, these were all legendary stories. So they set the ball rolling in how a set should be managed. Right. We set the ball rolling in how you can do multiple, like everybody's now doing multiple films under a production house. Yeah. Uh, Yashraj and we were the first pioneers of doing films with under a studio model, yeah. you know, so to say. Yeah. And I think when one does it, others get inspired and do it. And you know how it is. We are a, we are a herd mentality. Yeah. Uh, but in this case, it's for the good. So yeah. the better because the more the merrier more people yeah. creating better content so we maybe initially have pioneered the movement uh, but we're happy to report that it's a great movement to start I agree I cannot agree more and I feel all, you know you're so much more than just a director and a producer you've sort of become representative of the industry at large you know like a gatekeeper of sorts or like a spokesperson of sorts the thing is reckon? that I um, I never I'm, I'm not staged Shy. Uh, I'm happy to address an audience. From the very uh, beginning of my career, I was invited to um, Ivy League universities and colleges to speak at panel discussions. I was called from like from Harvard to Wharton um, to so many such institutions to you know sometimes give um, motivational speaks speeches or give like um, have panel discussions. I was part of Vicky. I was always at Mami. I was everywhere. Uh, speaking about not only the history of cinema, but the relevance of cinema, the soft power of cinema, the fact where we are today. Now now I'm asked about digital versus film everywhere yeah. I go. I've attended, we've, um, we've been at Cannes, at Berlin, at TIFF, and I've attended all those festivals multiple times. Um, I've never been just, I've, I've been at Davos four years in a row, um, you know, so it was like, I never fought Were you like a fish out of water at Davos? No, because uh, the thing is, when you could, there's a lot of respect for artists. Of course. And in a, it's like, it's like in a massively business-led conglomerate like that, what Davos is, the World Economic Forum. Um, it's exciting for even them to meet an artist, a filmmaker. So you know, you're on interesting panels and you're in interesting discussions, and then there are lovely evenings you spend with so many eclectic, amazing, strong minds from every part of the world. I enjoyed those years. Unfortunately, last the pandemic happened and you know I was meant to go this year as well, but there's too much happening work wise. So maybe next year. But I enjoyed my my years at Davos a lot. I thought I met people that I may never have crossed paths with if it wasn't for like my presence there. Also like the image of a celebrity is not somebody who's a thinker, speaker, storyteller, well spoken sort of an you know, someone with oratory skills. So I think that's also refreshing, you know, to be able to hold a room of of people who have very little in common with you and 
Yeah, which is why, I mean, it's somehow, number two, I don't know where along the line it just happened organically. It just started with me. I think it started from the first couple of interviews I may have given in my life. I think filmmakers are put in a box. You know, it's always actors that are supposed to shine and filmmakers are meant to be behind the scenes. That's right. Um, I was quite happy to be on the scene as well, yeah. not just stay behind. I was happy. I remember the year 2001 where I hosted the first first time I ever hosted anything was the Film Fair Award. Yeah. Um, Pradeep Guha at that time asked yeah. me to do it. And I was like, what makes you think that I can host a show? Yeah. He said, I've heard your interviews. Yeah. I think you'll be able to do it. And I did it. What started as something that I did, like just for a thing to do, yeah. like for a lark, went on to becoming a legit part of my personality yeah. and my my brand. Yeah. I asked, subsequently hosted God knows how many shows. Uh, I started my own talk show in yeah. 2004, yeah. Uh, which started again as a whim. As like, uh, I, I kept saying that I talked to so many people, why not get paid for it? <laughs> uh, you know, and it was the year 2004, November, where it got aired for the first time, what I thought would end in a season because it was just something I was doing is still on. Yeah. <laughs> it's been yeah. 19 years. So I'm like, uh, I never realized, none of these were plans. Yeah. These were things you did because you wanted to. That's what I tell everyone. I'm like, if you love something, you pursue it, you know, and it sticks because if it comes from your core conviction and you're good at it, then you should not fight shy. And don't fall prey to what I call stereotypes that come with everything. Oh, an actor must not behave like this. Mm. Or oh, a filmmaker must be this kind of person. Mm. A filmmaker must have mystery. Why? Who, who wrote this role? Mm. Where is it written? That a filmmaker can't be in front of the camera as well if he or she decides to. Nobody wrote these rules. I mean, everybody was conforming to what they thought. A filmmaker has to look serious. Yeah. A filmmaker has to, otherwise, who will take them seriously? I'm like, if my content is good, and I come from a place of love for my content, and I'm portraying that with so much abandon, then whether I judge a reality show, host a talk show, should not be in the way, you know? Yeah. Uh, don't respect me less because I do those things was always my way of looking at it. You know, back to films, I, I think, and I was telling you, you have this great sense of scripts and like stories. And I, I was immediately drawn right from Kuch Kuch Hota Hai, there's no doubt. But I think it would not work today. Like, you know, one film is about a tomboy who doesn't get the guy until she starts wearing saris, you yeah. know. Then, then Kabhi Kushi, Kabhi Gam is like, you know, a patriarch who's an absolute yeah. bully, you know. And, and then we've moved on to themes which had relationships and adultery. Student of the Year was your tribute, I think, to the, to the millennial and how desperate we were to sort of please them. And then we see Rocky Rani. I mean, there's this whole growth, yeah. you know, there's a whole, you know, you talk about it as relevance, but there's like a whole arc. But do you deliberately seek stories that speak to the year and now, you know, speak to the current cultural moment? I, I think, yes. I think uh, the evolution, number one, is also mine, along with uh, uh, the cinema that, that I represent or that I put out. Kuch Kuch Hota Hai, when I wrote it, it was me deriving from cinema because, you know, I had, my knowledge was just Hindi film. I had not gone to film school. I had not studied the grammar of filmmaking. I was an assistant uh, on Dilwale Dulania and the next thing, next thing I knew two years later, I was on the set directing a film. All my learnings was from cinema. So what today is called stalking and those days a, a lead man chasing the woman constantly was like romance. I thought, is me ashiki hai. And today I'm said, no, it's talking and it can have, you know, terrible repercussions. And I understood that. When I made Kuch Kuch Hota Hai, I was saying tomboy and tomboy becomes pretty. He falls for the prettier, hotter chick. Politically, gender politics wise, it's all wrong. I admit it. Shabana Azmi reprimanded me once. And uh, she asked, she said, What do you have to say? And I said, I'm sorry. I said, this is that. <laughs> There's no defense. Yeah. Um, Kabhi Kushi Kabhi Gam talks about patriarchy in the most patriarchal way. Yeah. Uh, Kalhuna Hodo uh, is where I felt like some part of the evolution began. Uh, 
Yeah. Because I, I believe that besides its melodramatic last 20 minutes, it's a film that holds your attention on various accounts of humor and emotion and love. Um, I lost my dad right after that. And I felt like he was the one who was making me very seeped into tradition in mm. a way because he was a traditional conservative man. I told my story about infidelity. Mm. Uh, it was met with such polarized responses. Mm. I meet people today who feel they've understood the film so much better mm. because they were not married when they first saw it. Mm. And uh, many have asked me why I endorsed infidelity. I said, look, you don't endorse something that's already sold out. Mm. You know, it's it's already a given in in so many households. I just made the poster boy of love and fidelity and monogamy and and friendship and romance, Shah Rukh Khan, you know, in the film, I made him with the person he was and what he did. And then they had sex before, uh, you know, be, you know, before confronting their regular spouses and that just shook, shook people up. Um, subsequently, I uh, wanted to very strongly make a film that was based uh, not only uh, um, not only based in our secular fabric of our nation that our constitution um, definitely talks about, but nobody was addressing it at that time as a feature film. So I wanted to make a film about the misinterpretation of a religion, and therefore I made my name is Khan. But I'm still slotted as that NRI bubblegum, good-looking people filmmaker. But I'm like, I have made my name is Khan. That was directed by me. Mm. It was a, um, it was a film that I believe very strongly, and I still do. Um, but post that, because that film got every, all the love and every, all the adulation, but I'd done two very heavy films. I felt like now I need to get back to making something younger. And I mm. took an all new cast and made my high school musical, uh, my very own, like, you know, and I knew that, my God, it's not moving a single cinematic mountain. This is not going to be remembered as a great film, but will it be remembered as a fun film? That was enough. And I really enjoyed it. I thought it was our Archie's, you know, you know, and it was meant to be. It was yeah. not meant to be. You're not meant. To, you're meant to love the music. You're meant to love the clothes. You're meant to love them. You meant to find yeah. them hot and like move on. Yeah, like you know, everybody needs. Look, there is that one eye candy film that you're going to love for just being eye candy. This is that film. Um, and then I had like a personal, um, unrequited love relationship that lasted a few years and uh, hit me, hurt me broke me, fractured me in ways that I can't explain. And I felt like as an artist, uh, people live vicariously, but we can also heal through the stories they tell. It can be the final catharsis for any artist. Making Edin Hai Mushkil was my cathartic moment. It's my most personal film. It's the film that I liked the most because I felt it was all me putting my love and my broken heart out there. and. Uh, and in the end, like, I know there were polarized reactions to the last act of the film where she dies of cancer, but it felt like it's my most personal piece of work. Um, it's something that I believe very strongly came from a very, very honest place in my heart. Yeah. And um, then I took a break. Uh, the, I was making a period, period historical called Takht, which took two and a half years of my time in terms of research and pre-production pandemic hit us and it wasn't the right time and then I went on to make Rocky Rani with all my new beliefs. Today. But you know that I feel is sort of a culmination for you yeah. like and I'm so maybe it's coincidental that it's come in your 25th year but I mean I loved it. Yeah. I, I unabashedly loved it. it. And it felt like all the politics I may have got wrong. You all, sort of corrected. All the oh God, yeah like it felt like 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 I'm self-aware of where I was wrong and let me correct it with Rocky or Rani without taking away the components of entertainment and, and music. And you got that balance. Like, you know, it was, it, it isn't your biggest hit, but it was, now I'm observing you. I'm, mm. um, I'm observing Karan Johar, the public figure. So for, for me, I feel like it was a commercial hit and it was critically appreciated yes. as well. And it's sort of the given you... The most I've ever had. I mean, I was in <laughs> shock that morning. When I woke up and I was like, I knew we would do well in India and blockbuster overseas, which is what it is. Yeah. But like, I okay. wasn't expecting that. It's every, given you a new strut. Like suddenly I was like, oh my God, that one, this one, him, her, they all. Like I walked in, I, I told my marketing uh, team, I'm like, we have a group, right? Yeah. You know? And I'm like, listen, please, I'm a bit fragile. It's, yeah. I'm coming up to seven years. Yeah. You know, I'm, 
I feel like it was my first film being released all over again. I was literally having an anxiety attack the night before. I thought I was going to just faint and fall. I was sweating at the screening the night before. And everybody's like, you've been around so many years. Why are you behaving like this is your first? I said, it feels like that. Because I feel like films like this entire year, Pathan and Javan and Animal, yeah. Dadar, and I'm like, I'm coming with this urban love story about family. I'm like, there could very be a possibility that nobody wants to watch it. And they were like, no, what are you saying? This, that. I said, I don't know how an audience is going to react yeah. to all this progressive, woke uh, messaging. Um, but it helped. And, and it landed beautifully. And the morning, I was, as I was going back to the marketing team, they were like, sir, we'd like to share the reviews. I said, I told you, I'm not, like, I'm really fragile. Don't, like, make me weep early in the morning. <laughs> they were like, sir, can we call you? And the three of them called on our joint, the three members of our team. Yeah. They were, like, screaming. They were like, sir, it's the best reviewed film yeah. for us at Dharma. Yeah. Like, we haven't seen better reviews. Yeah. I was like, what? Yeah. I was like, what? I sent the reviews now. So all the links. So I sat all afternoon just reading those reviews. And that goes back to the question that, oh, do filmmakers like diss critics and don't give them that, you know, importance. Not true. No, it's not true. We read everything. I yeah. watch everything. I want validation from everyone, including critics. I read each and every one. I even called a couple of them who wrote so beautifully, who may have never liked any film of mine. Yeah. Um, I remember there's a critic, uh, Rahul Desai, who writes for Film Companion. Yeah. And I don't think he's liked any film of mine. Yeah. Uh, and he's he's a very good critic. He writes very well. Um, I called him. I was like, you know, like, thank you. I'm very excited you like my film. Though, I mean, I in my mind, dissed him many times because he hasn't liked this and hasn't yeah. liked that. And I was like, who the hell does he think? Usual defense mechanism. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you do feel great when somebody who's never liked your film has liked this one. Yeah. And he was like, look, I loved it. I'm taking my mom to see it again. And I'm like, felt great. What can I say? It just was a great, great feeling. It's very generous of you to say that. But how important is commercial success and critical acclaim for a director and a producer? And do you feel that the director in you is sometimes at conflict with the producer in you? Yes, um, it does. Uh, I feel one thing very strongly. I feel money is very important. It is a balance of com commerce and art. But if you really ask me, and I hope Apurva doesn't kill me for saying this, uh, because he believes how important it is to make the money on a film, so that he said, look at our overheads, we run an enterprise, we have bills to pay, and you know. Um, but to me, I would be sad each time, even if a film is a hit film, and has made the money, I always think, will this be remembered? I feel like a lot of films today, I'll tell you, in the past, which were average successes or failures, but are so talked about today. Like? You know, like Lamhe. Hmm. Like, even a film like Masoom is a moderate success. You know, uh, there are so many great films that have come. The Gulzar Saab has made Ghar and Ijazat and... There are such beautiful films that we talk, we reference, we listen to the music today. They were not cinematic successes. Um, you know, we talk about, and the ones that did Golden Jubilee, if I mention five names to you, you won't even have seen one. So I'm like, commercial success is very critical. But leaving a legacy of love behind for your film is everything. I test a film 20 or 30 years down the line. Are we still talking about that film? Then we made a mark. Were you the biggest hit that year? May not be, but are people still talking about your film? Uh, they still find it, you know, exciting and relevant, and that's the true victory of a film. So is that's when your touchstone. That's your touchstone. Does the director in you ever dictate to directors who work with Dharma? I mean, support, never dictator. Never a dictator. No always. interference? No. Suggestions? No. All that happens, of course, all that happens when the final cut comes to me. Hmm. And but I'm I'm very collaborative by nature. And sometimes you see a film and you know nothing can repair it. And then you see a film and you feel, oh, it can be repaired. So let's bring in a new editor. Then I I come into the last stage of the film. The editing. Yeah, the last stage when it's done. I don't ever go on a film set when it's being made. I I think I go to visit every film once, um, just to say hello, and just touch base so that they don't think that the producer isn't interested. I'm very interested, very excited, very. Um, engaged with whatever's happening. It's just that I don't like to come there and play a director. I, there I come as the producer just give, to spread support and love. But where I do come on strong is in the, in the edit. Like yeah. I'm like, 
Sometimes you get so close to your material, you lose perspective, you lose objectivity. I'm here to check that. You are everyone's launchpad, actors as well as directors. Is that is that a compliment or is it sometimes pressure? I've never looked at it as a pressure. I've looked at it as a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and challenges don't pressurize me. They definitely motivate me. Um, I'm, I love a challenge. I love when, like, you know, I have to take up, if you have to create stardom for a yeah. completely mm -hmm. new kid and I have to do what it takes to build them as movie stars, that's a challenge for me. Similarly, with the first time director, I, I, I have a lot of pride in all the directors that have made their first pieces of work for me and, and then their second and third, because I feel like I'm so much a part of this, their success. So there's a lot of challenge. There's a lot of pride at the end result. There's some, there are some sad days, you know, when some decisions go wrong, yeah. some films fail, and we've yeah. had those moments as well where we've lamented a failure. But I always say one thing, it comes with time again, Amrita, none of this is, is suddenly, not, none of this has taken meditation or chanting or some therapy, yes, uh, and some anxiety uh, medication to kind of calm yourself down and reach a few conclusions. And one of them is that if you can treat success and failure with the same level of intensity, you'll be fine. The moment you rest on your laurel or you are bogged down by failure, both are detrimental. So I'm like, if success happens, celebrate it and move on. If failure happens, lament it, analyze it, and then move on. But moving on is very critical because you've got to just keep going. There's and that's you being, being, you know, young at heart. Like you're always looking for the next thing. Yeah. And I've seen that. I've seen that with your films. I've seen that through your interviews. You're always, what's next? Hogya. What's and next? And hogya or aage badho. Yeah. Like, you know, when, when I'm complimented now on Rocky Rani, I've already taken my flight. You know, I'm already sitting on another f content flight trying to make my next, writing and developing my next. Ho gaya. Like, Rocky Rani has come. It's got the love that I thought it, thankfully, I'm great, grateful for it. Um, but every time like, Ranveer calls me and tells me, like, or Alia calls me, oh, I met somebody who said, who said this, they send me messages. And I'm like, I don't know. Ho gaya. So what is next? Uh, I'm developing a film. Uh, I hope to be on the sets next year. Nice. Are you directing? Yes. Oh, superb. Can you tell me the economics of filmmaking today? I mean, earlier it used to be that, you know, if it's a good film, sometimes it receives commercial success, sometimes it tanks, later becomes a cult film like we were discussing. But filmmaking today is, you know, so it's like a manufactured like it's, a manufacturing process. Actually, if you talk about it very technically, there are um, there are four verticals that you have to put on a chart when okay. you make a film. I'll tell you what those verticals are. One is your risk recovery from satellite, uh, which is television, which is okay. at an all-time low right now because digital low. is the big one. Okay. Then there's a digital recovery, which is a large part of your pie. And there's a music uh, uh, component that also gives you money if you have a brand value for music and your film is musical enough and fourth is your estimated average box office potential of that film like is a theatrical. number you put. yeah theatrical worldwide you put a number to all and you should actually try and say that with the making of the film and my recoveries i'm at the same and the risk would be the uh, marketing costs that you need to incur uh, that's the best model of course, sometimes this model doesn't work when you go way beyond your budget. But ideally, you should, if your budget should equal these four components that I said, satellite, digital, music, music. and average, your average or rather lowest possible business that you think this film can do as per genre. And then equal that should be your budget. So it's all a mathematical calculation. It can be. It can be. If you are in the business, you have to do this math. You know, you are not, you're not just responsible to your creative urges. You're responsible to your company. Yeah. You know, your company that actually is, uh, are their income, their livelihood comes from you. Yeah. So, so while I might take a flight of fancy as far as my creativity goes, mm -hmm. how am I really catering to a commercial enterprise as well? No, my question is, there's so much of a film success depends on its marketing strategy as well. Yeah. You know, on how many memes you sort of generate 
you know how many well, that memes come from big failures more than big successes not necessarily or we i mean i i always feel like the meme culture is always when you're making fun of something that may not have worked yes of course memes work because oh, a lot of companies produce their own memes yeah, yeah, yeah. there's a meme factory yes, that yes, you yeah, know if yeah. you're a meme you were right yeah, internet of course or you're a reel you're a meme you're <laughs> yeah. used to basically a sta- or you're a gif yeah. you're like yeah. you're so many things i know we plan our reel campaign we plan the meme but yeah. it's it's mostly like you know a film will do well if you can book more shows or fill or you know seats i mean it's the thing is nothing can really salvage a bad film mm. and nothing can stop a good film mm. so these are all this is all vanilla right this is all you can put the vanilla icing but if your cake is not solid then what will that vanilla do you know if what what is what is holding you is that cake that strong cake it tastes really good and everyone loves it and you're just putting some icing on top of it just to kind of make it even more presentable to the world but then if you say that if you've recovered your money selling the digital rights for for a filmmaker who's a big brand and his music rights because the songs have always been amazing and let's say the digital rights or whatever you've already recovered but it's not about that it's also about the prestige that a big hit gives you mm. because your film can fail you may not have lost money but you've lost prestige you've lost you've lost brand value you've lost equity with an audience that believes in you so every failure will set you back every success will take you forward That's so filling point. those theaters is still important of course yeah and cinema for me there was this whole phase where everyone said digital is taking over cinemas are dead and suddenly this year they're saying digital is low cinemas are back yeah I mean, everyone like the song suggests. Kuch to log kahenge, logo ka kaam hai yeah. kya? Everyone has different thing. Every day, everyone wakes up with a new theory. Yeah. There are no theories. Yeah. There are no. It's an audience is always right, and an yeah. audience is very unpredictable. They can shock you at times. They can surprise you. They can appall you, yeah. and they can amaze you. Yeah. But they can always be. You. They can be. Always, you have to know that they are the final word. The king. The the consumer is king. Janta is Janardhan, and their word is final. Why does a Sam Bahadur still do seventy-five crores? Do it to stand against an animal? Yeah. Um, it still made the money this year. Yeah. So it's you can go beyond any. If with a good film, you can break every myth nice. and shatter every kind of uh, so-called trade analysis. No one knows anything. We all pretend to know. We don't know. So How the can, formula does it? There are exist? so many Indias in one India yeah. where it comes to an audience. Yeah. Uh, you'll never know how many of those Indias you're tapping into with yeah. your content. So if I pay hundred rupees for a ticket, where does that money get divided? Well, in tax first, then to the, <laughs> then to the distributor, then to the commission, and by the time you get about out of that hundred, you'll get home thirty-five to forty. A producer. Yeah. And uh, the salary of the star is included in that thirty-five forty, or that's separate. But you've already put in everything in your ATL, which is above the line budget, right? Mm. So this is after all that. Mm. Uh, if the money comes in, that's how much comes home. You know, certain films are also now commissioned by OTT platforms. So how does that work? Do they pay you an X amount to create content for them, and then it's theirs? And is it more? Profitable to be commissioned a film, or is it more profitable to make your own film? How well, obviously, it's more profitable if you can afford to make your own film. And then, so the thing is, with theatrical films, you are you are making your own film, and they have full right to watch it, read a script, choose if they want it. Post theatrical, eight weeks later, it's on their service. And those those are films that we make of our own accord, and then we, you know, we sell it to a leading streaming service. Uh, but then there are films made specifically for the streamers, right. commissioned Straight, by them. The direct commissioned by them. Then you have to listen to their pointers, which there. is more profitable. Uh, obviously, the theatrical then going to digital more profitable because when you make a digital film, you have a percentage of your profit that you get. Okay. But it's a short, you get it, but the number is not that large. So a digital is a volume game. You have to do ten things to really make money. If I'm just producing one digital show a year and one. Film coming out of there, it's not that much. So now that we're three years well into, you know, what are the OTT platforms and their popularity, uh, do you feel that they, that you can make a fair assessment of what kind of films will sort of work for theatre and what will work for OTT? I think um, each platform has their own base. What, but even they will tell you their highest numbers come from licensed films that are released in the theater, created havoc in the cinema, 
and then come to their service and done huge numbers. I think they've all realized that that's where the real big business is. Even in the series, I think that there are some series that have connected hugely with wide audiences. Also, the thing is, you might have a large subscription, but if the product is not good, the drop-offs can be very high. Like if your film or your series is rejected, my, everybody might tune in. So when you read number one, number one, but you don't know what the drop-off rate is, you know, people may drop off at 20% of the film they've left, but it's considered a view. Oh. But the drop-off rate is very critical. So sometimes films have lesser views, but very high drop-offs. Like they, that means many people have watched till the end. Many people have seen 18, 90%. That's high. But if you leave the film after 20% of the film, that's low, even if it's a number one for watched. Yeah. So there's a lot of the metrics keeps, but they know them. But question is, is there a genre of filmmaking that works better in OTT and a genre that works better in... I mean, like, you, well, initially it was like crime was working superbly. Crime still does work uh, superbly in OTT. In OTT. Yeah. I think love stories um, are working very well. Uh, YA stuff, love stories works very well on Netflix and Amazon and Hotstar. Uh, but predominantly, uh, like which started in Korea, you know, the K dramas, you know, going into the K love stories, uh, kind of taught us that people like to watch love stories at home. They like to watch crime investigative thrillers. They love to watch those at home. And uh, the tentpole massive productions are still like on celluloid. Would you be able to tell me how is your business divided between Dharma and Dharmatic? Because Dharmatic is also very popular. Yeah. Well, Dharmatic does about it. it the division is definitely 70 30 right now. We're still 70 focused on film and 30 on digital. Uh, but that could increase. You know, it depends on how our digital shows get received. Is there a film you wish you hadn't produced, had not produced? Uh, we, I mean, it's a tough question to answer because it would hurt the person who's made it. Uh, there are films that I feel felt that I that I shouldn't have greenlit, not produced, shouldn't have just not allowed it for the betterment of the filmmaker. They were all emotional decisions made at that time. Sometimes you don't like a script yourself, but you feel that the filmmaker's getting a cast, the filmmaker's coming from a failure. He or she needs this. And I've done it. And there are those. The only reason I won't mention them is because I feel that um, it would hurt them, you know, and I feel like I don't want to cause that within my own company. Is there a film you wish you had produced differently or maybe marketed differently? Um, no, so I think we market our films extensively. We give it our all no matter what. Um, I wish, uh, for example... Um, the only film that I feel like I wish I had packaged differently and made differently, forget marketed, is Kabi Alvida Nakena. I feel like I went on the front foot with it, uh, but I also compromised and tried to bring in some commercial elements like big set piece songs mm -hmm. and massive stars. I felt the film was always designed to be an intimate film. I feel like that's the one film I'd like to make again because I feel I'll correct it. What do you feel when a film flops? Sadness, predominantly. But I always know when it's going to. Yeah. I'm prepped because I feel like I have the ability to judge my films in a way where I'm not deluded or I'm not like biased to an extent that I can't tell the flaws or the loopholes or the fact that the film is just not connecting. We also do a lot of market research screenings. You get an indication. So I'm yeah. mostly prepared. There's, I don't think I've, I've really been shocked yeah. with the failure. I've been prepared. You feel sad, but at that point in time, I feel like I have to be there more for the lead actors and filmmaker than myself. Because um, somehow, I will still survive, but some of them, it could be career-breaking. Mm. You know, when a film flops massively. Um, I feel like a lot of people who are in the forefront of the film tend to be hurt much more by, which is the actors or the, the but director. But it's your money riding on it. Money comes, number three, it'll come. One film failing won't change my monetary destiny. What does it mean for dharma financially when a film flops? It's a who, film flop, who, you lose who, the money. Who, who you, takes the blow and how does it? We take the blow, obviously. 
um, we've always taken the blow and we make it up because uh, failures, um, as I said, have to be followed by successes if you are in the game and you're playing it because uh, strategically you know how to repair that. So give me an example. Uh, well, so many times has happened. Uh, we had like, uh, it's happened. Uh, we've had like, say, in 2018 when Kalank flopped, for example. But 2019, we ended the year with one of our biggest hits, Good News. I'm just yeah. telling you the two spectrum. Yeah. Um, it's been like that. Every year there's been a balance itself. In the same two financial years, we've given big hits and we've given some failures and the big hits have always come at the right time. So when you support your actors, how how do you tell how do you tell an actor that he charged too much or you know? very much in the in the negotiation stage where we're saying before that, the film. Yeah. The discussions are that I use this is this number viable and many times I've taken a step back when I felt the actor is just too expensive for the film. And maybe he, they are not realizing it, but like we know our business. Overpaying or underpaying both, I think, are sins that we commit. How do you uh, tell an actor that it's not worth it? You can just say it. It's not, it's not working. And an actor has to know because sometimes, you know, what we don't realize is that many people are walking under, the, under this big cloud of delusion. And delusion is a disease with no vaccination. <laughs> I, can, I can literally, uh, how do you cure this uh, delusion? You can't. I can't give you a tablet and you'll be okay. Or I can't give you a shot and you'll be immune to it. No, you will be deluded. And many are. Maybe I am also. We all have our delusion moments. But uh, but not making them aware of their delusion is detrimental and counterproductive. So you have to kind of tell them, look, this is your trajectory. These are your films. This is how much you've collected in the last couple of films. And there are massive stars who are above it all and are always very, very viable. And then there are some who are you know, believing they deserve a certain number, but on what basis exactly? Like you have to kind of tell them that, tell it politely, tell it nicely, but definitely save it because I'm not in the, I'm not in, in a place where I don't want to pay an actor their absolute market value rate. I do want to, but I also don't want to be taken for granted because suddenly somebody X is paying you doesn't mean I pay you the same. Why do big production houses now have legal departments? Oh, because there's so many cases that we filed on us on things that, that we didn't even expect. Uh, offending sentiments. But we are easily offended, always. Uh, you don't know who you're offending half the time. And people are just filing these FIRs against us. And, you know, from various parts of the country. And then you have a active... And now each film is run by digital. Like only when we get the green flag from digital do we go ahead and get on to set. Because they tell you this will be a problem, that will be a problem, cut that dialogue, cut that moment, cut that scene. And we listen to it most of the time. Because we, who wants to get into this? You know, Give me examples of what you cut. We, I mean, we've cut, I mean, like many times. Like they were mentioned sometimes of brands in a movie that you're not allowed to, you know, say in a derogatory light. Like, you know, or you talk about... Um, a religious community, a religious, a religious practice, and you're saying it in a in a way that could come across offensive. So many a time we made those adjustments, and especially when you make a film on the Indian Army or the armed forces, you have to get those permissions from the armed forces and the army. So if you go about it in the right way, then the sen even despite getting a censorship, you might still have somebody who might be offended by something that by like, an orange swimsuit, for example. Uh, yeah. Uh, it we had all kinds of like you know Radha on the dance floor, Radha yeah, yeah. to party, Radha. Yeah. We had some issues. We've had issues many a time. Our first legal issue was on Kabi Kushi Kabi Gam when uh, there was an objection to the national anthem being played in the film uh, because it was being played. So they expect they wanted the audience to stand up as well, but that was not corresponding with what a filmmaker wanted, right? So we have we fought that case, and it's still I think being fought somewhere. Really? <laughs> so, yeah. Sometimes you know. It takes time. But there are, from banal to absolutely justified, there are literally every ground that, that, that has been uh, covered by our legal team. I feel you've really done a lot for the queer community through your cinema. I mean, even if it was some sort of acceptance and comedy in Dostana, Kal yeah. Ho Na Ho, and I, 
I cannot love Rishi Kapoor anymore yeah. than in, you know, student of the year and your Bombay talkies where yeah. there's somebody's husband has, you know, an affair with sexuality. one of the, with the Kapoor and sons. male interns. So I think you've been instrumental in sort of bringing homosexuality out of the closet and into um, the mainstream where it didn't sort of exist before that in a very lovable, light-hearted sort of manner. And yet this is something you don't want to politically commit to. Uh, well, I think uh, um, it truly is my prerogative uh, to voice it in, in, in whichever way about who I am and what I represent. I think it's fairly clear and I've never like spoken about it directly only because I feel that's my choice. I would be, I would have that choice no matter what my orientation was. I would be private about my personal life which I continue to be. Um, I believe very strongly in, in the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, I believe in empowering them, telling those stories. And through our mainstream, we have from Dostana right up to Gili Puchi, which was uh, Neeraj Gevan's short um, in Najib Dasan's with Konkana and Aditi Rao Hedri in his leads. We've dealt with, um, we've dealt with sexuality in as dignified a way as possible, with positive messaging. Um, obviously, we as a company feel very passionate about it. It yeah. comes from me and the company and the fact that we always want to push the boundary and tell the stories that could make you awkward. Um, I even directed a film in Love Stories which spoke about a woman's right to sexual pleasure. Yeah. Um, um, where literally, and it, it was played to one of my songs yeah. when she has the final orgasm. And, yeah. um, again, it is about like, male entitlement yeah. to even sexual pleasure. Yeah. And I spoke about it. It's not just sexuality. We talked about infidelity. We yeah. talked about a woman's right to sexual pleasure. We've always broken stereotypes that get attached to us all the time. But these are the films we have made. And when it comes to the LGBTQIA plus community, um, uh, the idea is to always put it out in the most sensitive way. Yeah. Because it is a sensitive topic. Yeah. And it is a topic that has to be addressed. Yeah. Cinema is an impressionable medium. And if we don't, then who will? Mm. Um, and it's a large belief. But you know, I'm coming from a space where, uh, where there was a small group of people, a hotelier, a couple of lawyers, you know, they got together, they filed a PIL, they knew they would lose in this court to decriminalize homosexuality. Yes. And they had like a 10 year, 15 year plan and how they would eventually sort of strike it down. Then they came up with this, uh, with the with the queer marriage, which yeah. sort of didn't get sort of passed. And I and I have this conversation with a few filmmaker friends of mine that you know I I see often that multiple governments try to ban films or try to ban a certain uh, part of a film. And I feel that you know why don't filmmakers get together and 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 sort of file a little PIL? No, I think the industry comes together when we have you know, um, when reason to and when something is being maligned, their voices. Of course, a lot of the time I do feel like we can come together much more often. Um, there lies a lot of strength in unity. Somehow it's very difficult to rally the entire industry for one cause. Yeah. Uh, but we did during the pandemic when we had certain news channels who were saying heavily inappropriate things yes. about us. Yeah. All of us got together. And said, this is with Sushant Singh's episode. Passing. No, it was uh, about to do, uh, it just a general environment, not specifically this. It was to do with just the way Bollywood was being bashed, you know, across news channels, across some of the print media. Um, and we all got together and uh, and things were, were like made very clear and, and the Bollywood bashing stopped. Yeah. You know, and uh, it was ridiculous because you're, you, we, we were collateral damage for no reason. Yeah. Like why were we being attacked? It yeah. had nothing to do with anything. Yeah. Uh, you know, and just because you're a soft power, but you're also a soft target. Yeah. You know, and uh, we all came together. There are about, there were over 100 signatures on that, on that petition from the who's who of the industry. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that was a successful mission. We came together when we felt that we needed to. It had to happen. You know, when we stood together, each and every movie, film star, director, lead head of a studio, everyone. So it's not that we haven't come together. As, and your thought that we must, yes, we must come together for many things. Yeah. But it is not easy, as I said. 
you know, it is a challenge to make everybody, I think everyone has to really feel it for yeah. everyone to come together. And sometimes yeah. that feeling is not universal. Yeah. Don't want to talk about fees for direction, fees for advertising. No, I'm a director. Of, uh, no, I mean, these are each, my own fee, how can I? Uh, it's my company. I don't charge myself. Uh, um, Social media posts, events. Um, no. I mean, no? we're not here to give you that. No. That access or that information. No. Okay, because I mean, if it is a business story, and then we talk about the yeah, network. I mean, everything like what, what do you, the, the star deals are as per each actor individually. Right. Some of them are stakeholders in the film. Some of them have back ends. Some of them have profit percentages. Some of them have you know co-production, so they own IP along with you. Each actor has strikes a different deal depending on the film's budget and the circumstance you're in. Um, but we're uh, asking about your wealth. My wealth. Yeah. My wealth comes from the, my movies, my talk show. There are, as I said, there are. My wealth is divided between five verticals. One is uh, Dharma Productions. One is DCA, uh, where I'm a, a part holder along with Bunty Sachde. Um, one is Dharma 2.0, where I said Apurva, uh, Apurva, Puneet, and I are partners. Apurva is a stakeholder there as well as well as DCA, where Apurva is also a stakeholder, and Dharmatic, where only Apurva and I are stakeholders. And the last component is Karan Johar, the brand, which is the money that comes in through reality shows. And that's all endorsements. yours. Endorsements, yes. That's not company money. That's personal wealth. Um, yeah. So, I mean, like, what I charge for coffee with Karan is something that I'm not allowed to disclose because oh. uh, that's contractual. But Fair the one thing I'll tell you, which is unfortunate, which I don't think I've spoken about, is that I don't own IP of Coffee with Karan. Uh, I signed that off like 20 years ago. I didn't realize it was something that I was creating that would have been great. So Who they, owns it? They own Disney. It. Yeah. So you can't take it anywhere else. And if they can, replace me with Karan Thapar. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> they can't, technically. What are the chances of that? I don't know, but if I can be replaced, it can be only with Karan Thapar. I don't know if anybody else it would kind of cut it with. Okay, so who advises you financially? Apurva and Apurva and Apurva. Like he's my only one financial advisor. He's my financial policeman. He's my financial advisor. He's also my financial keeper. What is the future of Therma? Where do you see it going in the next five, ten years? We plan to go bigger, we plan to go wider, and we plan to create more content on all platforms, be it digital, be it cinema, or advertising. And uh, we hope that we can, you know, somehow or the other raise higher funds so that we can actually create a wider infrastructure for ourselves. And we hope that at age 60, when I throw my 60th birthday bash, we are a way larger conglomerate than we are today. But what will not change is that at that 60th birthday party, I will still be in sequence. You can still be? I will still be in a sequence jacket. <laughs> that will not change. You'll always be self-owned? Or would you look for investment? Uh, I'm not close to the idea, but I'm not. Um, but I would believe that if it happens, um, I would never want to lose control. But I'm not close to the idea, though it's been discussed, and there have been offers, very gracious ones, but we've kept away so far. But as I said, I'm not close to the idea. But I haven't actively acted on it as yet.